Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, HRU once again. This is our last uh, our last time slot of the day, uh, and uh, we're doing uh, basic practical antennas. I'm Neil KC2KY. Uh, these slides are available on the Radio Central Amateur Radio Club webpage. I'm the president of Radio Central Amateur Radio Club. Uh, RCARC.org slash presentations.htm or you can just go to the home page and then on the on the uh, left hand side there's a there's access to uh, club presentations and this this presentation as well as the one I did this morning are both available there so I've been into uh, ham radio since uh, 1971 I got my first ticket when I was 12 years old and I've been doing it for uh, over 50 years now and I've been on the HRU committee and involved in HRU since its inception in uh, 2000 or 1999 is when we just started talking about it. Uh, you may have seen this slide in a number of presentations. This is dedicated to the memory of our um, our uh, founder who has since passed away uh, in 2020. Uh, Phil, he hatched the idea in 1999 of doing a, a day of forums and seminars. And I've been doing this every year since. So I always uh, do this plug uh, at the beginning of every HRU talk I ever do. Your ham license uh, gives you some interesting privileges above and beyond just going on the air. Uh, it allows you to uh, build your own equipment, operate, maintain, modify as long as you stay in the hand bands and and uh, you know, meet all the requirements of, of your radio other services don't allow you to do that it's a unique privilege that you should not take for granted and um, if you're like most hams you may not have built a radio but you have or will build a radio station including an antenna and antennas are there are antennas that can be home brewed with uh, simple materials that you can get from a Lowe's or a Home Depot so let's get started okay we have two antennas here we have a, um, a portable uh, super antenna that packs up in a suitcase uh, that you can carry around in the trunk of your car and then we have this huge uh, gi ginormous uh, contesting array of multiple monoband Yaggies. And these two antennas have uh, some things in common, three things in common. Number one, they're both compromised antennas. Sounds like a surprising thing to say about the antenna on the right, but uh, if the owner of that tower had twice as much property, twice as much financial resources, and twice as much time, he would probably not be satisfied with that antenna system. He'd probably be looking to upgrade from there to something even bigger because uh, uh, contesters tend to play to win. And if they have the resources to put up a lot of stuff, they do. Both antennas were designed with specific constraints in mind. They were built for specific purposes. Um, that big contesting array is not something you're going to carry out to activate a park on the air. Uh, the little one on the on the left will get you on the air at, at a at a park, but it won't it won't uh, break too many pileups to rare DX stations, and you know you'll make contacts in contests, but you won't always uh, be the first one to get in. But you'll have a lot of fun with it. Both of these antennas will get you on HF, so. So there you have it. Uh, if this is what you're looking for, if this is the question you're looking for an answer to, you, uh, what if I had, uh, you know, 100 acres and enough enough money to start my own space program and, and unlimited time and, and a huge crew of people? What kind of an antenna could I put up? Uh, you might you might find this forum not to be what you were looking for. Uh, we're going to be more focused on what we can do with what we've got. A uh, typical Long Islander may have, if he's got property at all, he might have a quarter acre of land or a third of an acre. 
uh, maybe a couple of trees on the property and you know what can I do with what I've got every antenna is a compromise antenna uh, and uh, there's a lot of constraints here I've identified six here there's more that we'll talk about later on but we have neighbors that we have to live with uh, some of us live in uh, uh, restricted uh, homeowners associations where we have committees telling us what we can put on our property uh, we have families that we have to uh, please we don't want to wind up in divorce court over a radio tower uh, we have our own skill level our budget uh, available man manpower who we have to help us so there's a lot of different things that constrict what kind of an antenna you can uh, get up there so let's start with a simple uh, single band uh, center fed dipole this is an antenna that is tuned or cut for a particular frequency sort of like a guitar string it resonates at one frequency or range of frequencies um, at the frequency the antenna is cut for um, the current is at its maximum at the feed point and the voltage is at its minimum so it's a, a low impedance at the feed point about 70 ohms if the antenna is up in free space or more than half a wave off the ground if the antenna is closer to the ground the impedance gets closer to 50 ohms so it's a it's a good match for a section of coax uh, going back to your your uh, radio room so that's a good starting point for an antenna if you have one favorite band you want to operate on uh, this is an effective antenna especially if you can get it nice and high up in the air and if we take that same antenna let's say we built it for 40 meters or 77 megahertz and we try to use it on 20 meters uh, we run into a bit of a problem the the uh, on on on, at, as a full weight antenna at the feed point the voltage is at a maximum and the currents at a minimum so what you have is it looks like an open circuit to the uh, to the end of the coax and the antenna is not accepting power from the transmitter so it won't work too well on 20 meters there's other remedies of that later on but as a center fed antenna that that won't work too well but it will work on a third harmonic because the the current the minimum uh, voltage maximum current repeats itself at odd multiples of the frequency so odd harmonics good even harmonics bad back in our novice days uh, uh, novices had privileges on 80 meters 40 meters and 15 meters so if you got a 40 meter antenna up there you had a residual benefit of being able to use it on 15 so let's take uh, take a look at uh, what length to make this antenna to tune it to the band we want. Everybody that's ever passed a, uh, a license exam knows this formula 468 over the frequency in megahertz and that's the length of the antenna in feet. So one of the constraints I identified no fewer than six constraints that make your antenna a compromise antenna. There's one more that I didn't mention and that's time what when are you going to be able to use your station if you're working stiff like me you may not get as much opportunity to operate during the day you may be operating more at night some bands like 80 meters works better at night uh, 40 is also a nighttime dx band but you can do some local quasi local cues during the day 20 meters is your meat and potatoes daytime dx band and at the top of the sunspot cycle, it'll, it'll be uh, open 24-7. As you go higher and higher in frequency, you get fewer band openings, but they get more intense. And right now, 10 meters has been on fire lately. And if you look at this table of lengths of antennas, look at the length of that 10-meter antenna, 16 feet end to end. You can fit that almost anywhere. Uh, if you've got an average Long Island piece of property and you a little bit creative you might be able to get an 80 meter antenna shoehorned onto your property 40 meters more likely almost anybody can find some place to get a 20 meter antenna up if you have a two-story house with a crawl space above the second floor you can even 
uh, sneak a 40 or a 20 meter antenna into your attic. So coming back to this formula, where does this magical number 468 come from? You had to remember that number to pass the test. Well, radio waves travel at the speed of light. So that's 300 million meters per second. Convert that to feet and then figure what's a half wavelength. It would be 492. So why isn't the magic formula 492? Well, there's various reasons that people argue over end effects a velocity factor of the wire, uh, you know, the speed of light going through free space is faster than the speed of light through a piece of wire. Uh, interaction with the ground, uh, the ground composition at MyQTH in Bayport might be different from somebody's in uh, Stony Brook or Queens. Uh, there's interaction with other local objects. So people found um, empirically that the antenna's got to be about 5% shorter. So five, you take 492 and make it 5% shorter, you get approximately 468. But that's still, that's a rule of thumb. It's probably going to be different at your specific location. So it's going to be a certain amount of trial and error, getting, getting your antenna to be one-to-one -one or the best SWR you can get where you intend to operate. So here's what I like to do. I like to take the dipole and I make it so that the, the length from insulator to insulator is a little bit too short, and then I hang some tails at the end that make it a little bit too long. And then we can trim the tails down with a pair of wire cutters until we get it resonant. And once it's all tuned, those tails will be a little bit shorter than they were when you first built the antenna. But you'll be able to cut it down, and it's easier to make it a little bit shorter with these tails than to make it longer. So how much do I want to cut off those tails? Well, if we do a measurement with an antenna analyzer, we know where the minimum, where the best SWR is, uh, we get an idea whether the antenna is too long or too short. And if, if the, uh, the trick we did with the tails made the antenna too long, well, that's I love it when a plan comes together because now I can just chop the antenna down with just a pair of wire snippers and bring it in. And these equations uh, will give you an easy way to kind of calculate right away how much to cut off. So if, let's say I want to, you know, the, 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 the frequency where your SWR is best is a little bit low, then the actual frequency you measured over the divided by the planned frequency is going to be a number slightly less than one. You subtract that from one, you're going to get a small number. You're going to convert that to um, multiply that by the original length of the antenna in feet, and then convert that over to inches. You out is going, going to tumble a number that says I want to cut cut the tails down by a certain amount. Uh, if you made the antenna too short to begin with, then the then the minimum SWR is going to be above the top end of the band or above the frequency you want to be at. So you're going to have to make it longer. And it's kind of a very similar formula. So let's do a little walkthrough here. We're going to go on, we're going to build, we're building a dipole on 40 meters. And what's the latest, hottest, most popular mode around is FT8. And the watering hole for FT8 on 40 meters is 7.074 megahertz. So our starting point, if we uh, plug it into our, um, license exam memorized formula, we get about 66 feet, two inches. So each side of the dipole is 33 feet, one inch. So if we follow our plan, we're gonna make the main sides of the antenna about 95% of that, so 31 feet, five inches. And then we're gonna hang some tails from there, a little bit, maybe two and a half feet. So we're deliberately making the antenna too long with the tails, but too short if I, cut the tails out altogether. So as I start snipping those tails down, I'm going to get a length that's just right. So we're going to take that whole business, we're going to haul it up into our uh, support structure, our trees, whatever. And we're going to get an antenna analyzer and we're going to measure the uh, SWR over a range of frequencies, find the frequency that has the lowest SWR. So if we made the antenna too long, that frequency is going to be below 
our planned frequency of 70, 74. So let's just say for argument's sake, we do the measurement and we get 6.998 megahertz. So the antenna is too long as planned. We take that 69.98 and the 70.74, which is where we want to be, plug that into our equation. And we get that we have to cut each of the tails down by about a little over four inches. So we trim the tails down. That should get us pretty darn close to 7074 on the on the first iteration. And if we succeed at that, we'll probably be okay across the entire 40 meter band, all of the CW band, and most, if not all, of the phone band. So here's what we wound up with: the antenna, a 40 meter antenna optimized for FT8. Uh, but it should be okay for the whole band. And if you tune it for a little bit higher, like 7.1, you're going to be you're going to be golden for the whole 40 meter band. So that's a uh, a single band uh, 40 meter antenna. Uh, we showed some insulators here and some ideas on where to get insulators or how to make them yourself. First of all, you can buy these insulators. You just go to Amazon.com and you'll find these dog bone insulators. Um, you know, a 10 pack of them for a few bucks where you're paying like maybe $2 a piece for the insulators. Uh, if you look at this dog bone insulator, you see these ridges in the middle. And if you've ever wondered what they're for, what they do is they increase the amount of surface area between the two holes, between the wire and the rope going up to the support tree. So you get just a little bit more insulation, particularly when when it gets rainy or damp outside, it just makes the insulator a little bit more effective. You can homebrew insulators nice and very easily. Just find a piece of material that, that's not porous, that doesn't absorb water when it rains. So wood is not necessarily a good choice or sponge, but a piece of Lexan or even some um, PVC conduit that you can get dirt cheap at a Home Depot. Just drill a couple of holes and, and you're off to the races. A uh, quick idea for a center insulator is cut like a little T-shaped piece and just drill a bunch of holes, uh, holes for the wires, and then another couple of holes for some uh, zip ties to to uh, to clamp down on the coax. And one of the more recent issues of QST actually had a whole article on 3D printing. And you can 3D print a lot of this stuff and come up with some pretty cool ideas. Okay, so supporting this thing, if you have two trees that are the right distance apart and you can get this antenna supported horizontally, that's a good way to go. And what I'm showing here, if you look at it carefully, is I have one rope where I pull a pulley up the tree and then the, the rope that I hold the antenna up is going through the pulley. Uh, that makes it a little bit easier to haul the antenna up and down. You're not going through the, you know, a crotch or a fork up in the tree where there's a lot of friction. So there's friction when you're just pulling the pulley up and not, not uh, pulling up a lot of extra weight. But when you're pulling up the antenna where the weight starts to add up between the wire and the coax, you're going through a pulley, which is a lot easier. And if you look at the way the rope is configured, I have positive pull down, so I can pull the thing down easily to make changes. Ideally, you'd like to get this whole business at least a half wave up off the ground. Uh, on 80 meters, that would be 130 feet. On 40 meters, that would be 66 feet. Most of us can't accomplish that, so we do what we can. We, if you can get the thing up 40 feet off the ground, you're going to get reasonably good results and uh, be able to make some contacts on 80-40 meters work some dx with it and it'll be more than high enough on 20. if i only have one really tall tree uh, the antenna doesn't have to be horizontal it can be shaped like an inverted v uh, you want to keep the endpoints high enough off the ground that somebody straying onto your property doesn't put his hands on it while you're putting power into this thing because again, the endpoints are going to be the high voltage points. So you want to get the endpoints at least maybe 10 feet off the ground. Uh, height is not as critical with this type configuration. 
as with a flat top, but it's still higher is always better. Um, and you want to get this thing up as high as you can. But the nice thing about this is you only really need one tall support for that. So if you have one really nice tree on your property, this is a nice configuration to, to work with. Uh, suppose I have two really nice trees, but they're not quite far enough apart. I want to put up an 80 meter dipole. I got two trees that would be perfect, but oh, oh snap, they're only 100 feet apart and I need 130 feet. Well, you, there's no reason you can't come up with an inverted U type configuration where you you get it, you get the, the main horizontal part as long as you can, and then what's left over, you come straight down or you come out at an angle, so you have like a trapezoid type thing. The middle 60% of the antenna is doing most of the work on transmit, so it'll, it'll work. It can be effective, an inverted U antenna. So that's another option that you have. Will a dipole work? Does it have to be horizontal? Will it work if you make it vertical? You bet, it sure will. Uh, this is kind of an idealized uh, situation um, that I'm drawing here. You'd have to, the, the feed line really wants to be maintaining uh, right angles to the wire. So what, what I'm showing you here is not always the most practical way to, to, to make a half wave vertical antenna. Uh, the nice thing about this is in the on the x-axis in your property because you have all the height you you know as high as you can build a support but you may not have as much uh, space horizontally uh, verticals have a smaller footprint and they don't have to be up in the air to work well they can be uh, you know they can start at the ground level uh, other than that, they work on the same basic principle as a dipole, and they have a low, uh, what's called a takeoff angle. So that makes them good for uh, DX. They they don't, you're not going straight up in the air and straight back down again when you hit the ionosphere. So you, you, they're, they're good DX antennas. Here's a more practical approach if you want to build a down and dirty vertical antenna. This is great for, um, for portable, something you can set up. In, um, in field applications like a parks on the air application or even a field day or, or whatever. Um, if, you, if you start with um, a piece of wire and whatever comes to hand, if you have a spool of 22 gauge wire, you make a, you cut a quarter wave section of that. We'll go with lengths on the next slide. And Connect that to the center conductor of a piece of coax. Um, protect it with some heat shrink sleeving or some tape, electrical tape. And then another quarter wave down the coax. Um, we put in a line isolator, which we'll talk about how to do line isolators later on in the presentation. And the shield of the coax from the line isolator up the shield of the coax becomes the lower side of the antenna and the the center point where the arrow is pointing this is your feed point and you take this whole business and hang it hang it from a tree or from a um, telescoping um, kite pole or something and, and away you go you're on the air so here are the lengths I Picked up an article on how to build one of these antennas, and the lengths are a little bit shorter than the than the than the famous 468 formula, even. And it may have something to do with the nature of the coax or whatever it is, but these these lengths seem to work out okay. Again, you might want to start a little bit long and then trim it down as you go. Um, this is it's a great idea on uh, say 20 through 10 meters. Uh, 40 meters and 80 meters, you need some really tall support structures to support one of these. Um, if you have if you have a pole that's 60, a wooden pole or a non-conductive pole that's 63 feet high or 120 feet high, you can probably do better with a dipole or an inverted V or something like that. But you know, for 20 meters, 30, 31 feet is not that hard to accomplish as a uh, top end point to hang this thing. 
and they work pretty well. I built one of these up for um, for a POTA activation back in November, and it really it played like uh, gangbusters. 160 meters is technically that 160 is not an HF band. HF is three to 30 megahertz, but 160 is another popular HF band. Um, a lot of radios, most radios today will do 160 meters. Back in the back in the day, they they really did 80 through through 10. But if you want to get on 160, you can you can a dipole on 160 would be 256 feet of wire. Who's got that kind of property for a full size dipole? But you can you can make a, a vertical, and there's an article here on how to how to construct this thing. Uh, it's made out of PVC pipe that you can pick up at a um, at a Home Depot or a Lowe's, and wire you can usually find large spools of 22 gauge wire at a ham fest that you can pick up for a song and you can get on 160. So when you go on that website they'll tell you this is a no excuse antenna for getting on on the top band what they call 160. It's a good uh, wintertime band. Most of the stuff we've talked about up till now have been single band antennas but you can also build antennas that'll work on more than one band. This this antenna here, this is what's called a fan dipole, where you start hanging multiple dipoles off of a common feed point. So if you remember earlier on, we said, what if I try to use a 40 meter antenna on 20 meters? And the answer was, it's a no, no go, because a 40 meter antenna center fed on 20 meters looks like an open circuit. So why don't we just add a 20 meter dipole to the same thing. So now when I go on 20, the 40 meter sections do nothing and the 20 meter section acts as an antenna. Then on 40 meters, the 20 meter section is a near open circuit and the 40 meter side works. And as an added bonus, uh, the 40 meter section will resonate on 15. And just a little trick here is if you cut the 40 meter section if you optimize that to work where you want on 15 and if it's a little bit off on 40 and you need a tuner to tune it on 40 meters no big deal the coax has a lot less loss on 40 than it does on 15. so here's an antenna that'll that'll work on uh, three bands for you and if you wanted to add fifth, uh, a 10 meter section you could do that as well uh, Here's something I saw. Um, I met this W1ZR. I can't, his name escapes me right now. I'm terrible with names, but he he was a uh, technical editor editor for QST magazine, and I met him at a ham fest up in Connecticut about 15 years ago. And he's got this concept of a skeleton sleeve uh, dipole. So what it does is it on um, in this example on 40 meters you've got this round trip from, from the gap on the left side around, I don't know if you can see my mouse, I'm hoping you can, around round trip to here, that's your 40 meter section. And then on 20 meters, that the RF gets coupled onto this 30 foot, 10 inch section. So now you have an antenna that's about 10 feet shorter than a full length 40 meter dipole and it works on 20 and 40. And it's a fairly easy antenna to tune because you you you, you tune the, the 40 meter side first and it very minimal interaction with the 20 meter side so once you get the 40 meter side resonant where you want it then you start cutting that 30 foot 10 inch section down until you're where you want to be on 20 and you have a dual band antenna and again it'll it'll work on 15. Uh, here's a famous ubiquitous uh, G5RV multiband dipole that a lot of people use if you have 101 feet. This can be set up as either a flat top or as an inverted V. Uh, it works better as a flat top and the higher you get it the better. You want to get it at least high enough so that the bottom of this section of ladder line isn't touching the ground. So 31 feet or higher is, is better. 
this this antenna will work well on 80 40 and 20 you can you can use it on 15 and 10 meters and, and some of the warp bands but it may not be as effective it may have different nulls and and uh, peaks but it's a good a good antenna on 80 through 20. Uh, you're going to need a tuner on uh, most of the bands. Uh, one one variation I tried, I put one of these up and I started fooling around with it. And a G5 RV built to the original plan. If you if you uh, look at where it resonates, it's a perfect 50 ohm antenna, right at 7.8 megahertz. So I looked at that and I said, that's pretty close to 40 meters. What do I? What can I? What can I do to make move that 7.8 down and I started fooling around with the length of the 31 foot ladder line section and if I lengthen that to about 35 or 36 feet there's a magic length where it's a perfect 50 ohm match right in the middle of the 40 meter band so you can make this thing a perfect 50 ohm antenna that'll work on 40 without a tuner and then with a tuner you can still load it up on 80 and 20 and have a reasonably good multi-purpose antenna so it makes it a nice uh, starting antenna if you don't have 101 feet you can cut all these dimensions in half and you'll get an antenna that'll work on 40 and 20 not so good on 80 but um, again you get it up in the air uh, it'll be 51 feet end to end with uh, about a 16 and a half foot feed it'll resonate at 15.6 megahertz instead of 7.8. You can fool around with it and get it to resonate perfectly on 20 meters. And if you want to go the other way, if you have, happen to have 202 feet, but not quite the 256 feet of a real 160 meter dipole, you can double everything and have a double G5 RV and it'll, you'll have a, a, a 160, 80, 40 antenna that'll work. So there's all kinds of different variations. You can buy one of these things assembled for about 70 bucks, or you can build one yourself. Uh, the ladder line is something you're gonna you're gonna wind up going online to a company like the Wireman and and buy it. And uh, the wire is stuff you can either get at Lowe's or there's wire that's really optimum for antennas that you can get, and you can build it yourself for probably less than what you can buy one for. Another variation is just get as much, as long a wire as you can get up there, as high as you can and as long as you can, and come down with um, ladder line right to your antenna tuner. Uh, most commercially built antenna tuners uh, have, a, have an input for um, a balanced uh, feed line, and you can tune that. Uh, Here's an, uh, another variation, an off-center fed dipole. So we're going to take our, our full wave dipole that you can't feed at the center, but you take that same antenna and you move the feed point um, to about maybe 21% down. There's people that have tried different lengths, but you're, you're, you're closer to the desirable high current low voltage point. And now that antenna will work nicely as a full wave antenna. And if you feed it at the right place, you're going to have man manageable impedances on all the bands. You won't necessarily be able to use it on all the bands without a tuner, but you'll have something that can be managed and brought into a reasonable match with a tuner. And here's a variation where you transition from uh, ladder line to coax and put in a uh, some ferrite uh, choke cores at the end there to keep keep some of the rf off the field the shield and that'll that'll allow you to maybe alleviate potential problems with rf getting into your your shack and getting into stuff in, in the radio room uh, the this these line isolators that I've been talking about on, on several antennas come in different different shapes and sizes. What I did with my 20 meter uh, vertical that I used at the POTA activation is I just took an old uh, coffee can and I wrapped 
10 terms of coax around the coffee can. And what that did was um, it gives you uh, an inductor the shield, for the shield that keeps the RF from getting past the top part of the coax to the to the part that's strictly for feeding the the rig so that the bottom half of that is not part of your antenna anymore or you can you can get some ferrite beads and uh, just slide them over the coax it's a little bit of a challenge because you got to slide them over the coax first and then solder the connector on so you got to be willing to do that if you have a piece of coax with the connectors already on there are snap in ferrites that that open up and snap onto the coax i don't believe that they're as effective as a um as a, a full you know a bead slipped over the coax but they're easier to work with or you can just run the get get one of these big uh toroids and just round the wrap the coax around the toroid a few turns make like a choke ballon that way or you can buy one of these line isolators it's basically just a bunch of ferrites wrapped around coax and they re retail for about 60 bucks and that's a nice elegant solution that a couple of people have used with a lot of success some ideas from antenna for some antenna getter uppers uh, one is an easy hang which there's companies that commercially make a slingshot with a fishing reel and you just shoot the sinker up into a tree and let it let it fall down uh, this is something you've got to really check your local laws you're really not supposed to have to use stuff like that in new york state people do anyway uh, another way to get an antenna up into a tree is a magic rock with a string wrapped around it you tape it up enough so the rock doesn't slide off the tree you just toss it up into the tree hopefully over like a fork in the tree and let it come down and now you have uh, a line that you can you can do I like this picture of me. I like uh, the idea of a fishing rod with a golf ball at the end with some uh, ultra, ultra light or fairly light freshwater line, like eight pound test. And you can cast a golf ball up into a tree and it'll go up and it'll come flying down. And then you take the golf ball off the end, tie it to a piece of something a little bit heavy, like some mason twine, like this yellow thing you see that and you, uh, Reel, reel the line up through the tree and then if it's going to be something permanent once the mason line is through then you transition that to maybe some heavier duty rope and you reel that back through the other way and now you have a rope up in your tree that you can use to pull up the dipole antenna and this uh, other thing that you can homebrew or you can buy this ready-made is a pneumatic launcher that'll launch something like a tennis ball way up in the air and the, the people that build this launcher advocate on their website that you instead of using a golf ball or a sinker or something like that you use a tennis ball uh, because on the way down it, it'll lose some momentum on the way down because of wind resistance and if somebody happens to be standing there and they get hit in the head with a tennis ball they're less likely to be seriously hurt than if they get hit with a golf ball which could be a trip to the emergency room okay uh some recommended reading here uh i've got some uh some articles here joel hallis that's the name i was trying to remember did a uh a presentation on um various multi-band antennas and i i stole i mean adapted some of his ideas in my presentation so you can take a look at that and he'll he'll talk in more detail about various antennas, about double extended ZEPs, G5RVs, various other antennas. And the 160 meter antenna, I got that idea from a, a member of the Boiled Owls who, who built one of these for 160 meters. And there's a, uh, there's a whole website that tells you exactly how to build this thing up and uh, some details on that. So those are a couple of different uh, web pages you can look at there's a couple of good ARRL publications there's one book that deals entirely with 
building antennas for small or limited space. Not all of us have as big a property as we'd like to have for full size antennas. So there's, there's ways of uh, getting stuff up there that'll get you on HF, even if you don't have 10 acres. Uh, a couple of books just on wire antennas, even more wire antenna classics. And they have some pretty exotic uh, antennas. It's an interesting read. Uh, a whole book just on dipole antennas. And finally, the the, uh, <clears throat> the definitive uh, book on antenna design is the ARRL antenna book. And uh, that'll, uh, that's when you're ready to really go through a lot more uh, in in-depth information about antennas, how to build uh, Yagi or beam antennas on uh, both VHF and HF. And uh, it's got a lot of information. This whole slide deck, again, is available on, um, on the Radio Central Amateur Radio Club uh, webpage, rcarc.org. And I managed to run out of material before I ran out of time, which is always a good thing. That's fantastic, Neil. So uh, I, our uh, organizer on the in the background there, whose voice you just heard, was uh, Pete W2JV. He's my uh, co-pilot here, and uh, any questions you might have, you can enter into your. Uh, there's a place where you can enter questions, and uh, Pete can. Reload, relay those questions to me. I will do my best to answer them. If if you stop me with a question I don't know the answer to, I will do my best to find out and get that back to you. All righty, Neil. Take a sip of your favorite beverage. Your forum lived up to its title, Practical HF Antennas. It was very practical and uh, really enjoyed it. I'm sure the attendees enjoyed it as well. As always, Neil, thank you. You're a uh, cornucopia of information, good information. Okay, a couple of questions. Here's a question from Joe Butler. Joe, I hope you're still around. Uh, I live in an HOA, and I was wondering if the super antenna would be a good option for me to get on HF. I was also considering putting an HF antenna in my attic with my VHF UHF antenna. They complained about me putting up an off-center fed dipole. What are my options for a stealth antenna? Now, in case you don't know what a super antenna is, Neil, I have one, and I can discuss that. But uh, go ahead with uh, your answer to that question. Okay, yeah, the super antenna, I, I, the, the earlier slide I had when I showed these are both compromised antennas, I think that was a super antenna. And it's, it's a nice option because number one, if you wanna take your act on the road on a nice day and operate in a park, you can set it up there. And if you have a backyard and you're just not allowed to put a permanent antenna up, you can set that thing up in the backyard, go on the air, make a few contacts, and before anybody has a chance to come and complain to you about it, you can take the thing down. It's not permanent. And you probably won't get in any trouble with it unless you start, you know, wiping out somebody's TV or something, which doesn't happen as often as it did back in the early days, pre-cable. So, so that's a good option. I actually lived in one of the earliest HOAs in the 70s. Uh, I, 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 we actually lived in Stony Brook when I got my first ticket. And when I was 15, my dad was nice enough to uh, buy me a beam antenna that I put on the roof. And about a year later, he announced we were moving to Columbia, Maryland. And we weren't allowed to put up any antenna of any kind, not even a television antenna. So I had to sell the beam. And we lived in a two-story house with an attic above the second floor. So there was like a crawl space where you could crawl around and that crawl space is like maybe 25 feet off the deck. And you can put, I put a 40 meter attic antenna in there. You can, you can zigzag it to your heart's content as long as your SWR is good and it'll work in the attic. So if you're talking about a single family house, you could put, you can get an HF antenna into your attic, depending on how the, the house is oriented. You might even be able to build a wire beam you're not going to be able to rotate it, but if, if your house is oriented where the beam can be pointed northeast, you can build a 20-meter antenna that's beaming Europe or beaming the southwest, 
depending on how you want to use it. So attic antennas are certainly um, a viable option, provided that the upper part of your roof is not insulated with something metallic that's going to be a Faraday shield. So I hope I helped out with that answer. Oh, you sure did. Thank you, uh, Neil, and thank Good you, options. Joe. I've been there, and there's things you can do. You can get on HF with an, in an HOA. There you go. This is a message from Scott Corsano. He said, when would it be better to have the wire antenna vertical or horizontal? I would say um, it depends on what what options you have, what what you what resources you have on the property. If you have a couple of trees where you can get a horizontal antenna up and get it up 40 feet up in the air, I would go horizontal for sure. Uh, verticals are if if you you know if you need to have like a small footprint on the property. And the wire vertical was the, adapt, the example I gave just because it's something you can make yourself out of wire. But there's store-bought verticals out there, and if if you can't get a horizontal antenna up there, that's when I would go with a vertical. Um, so that that's kind of like the short answer. So if you if you can, like let's say 20 meters is your favorite band. If you can get a 20 meter up antenna up as a horizontal uh, flat top, uh, 33 feet up or higher, that's going to that's going to far outplay any vertical. Even a G5 RV will outdo a vertical in 20 meters. From the expert. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you, Scott, for the question. Scott also asks, what are the advantages, disadvantages of an end fed versus center fed? Um, well, an antenna, a given, a given size antenna, say a half wave antenna, is going to have the same radiation pattern no matter how you feed it. Uh, the advantage of a center fed is you don't need anything fancy between the coax and the antenna. If it's if it's a half wave resonant antenna, it's 50 ohms and, and you just run the coax to the, the antenna. With an end fed, if it's a half wave or even a full wave or whatever, an end fed, the at the end point of the antenna where you feed it, it's a very, very high impedance. So you need a um a ballon or a transformer that'll that'll take you from 50 ohms to, to like a thousand ohms or whatever uh there's there's a bunch of 49 to 1 ballons out there that are commercially available that, that will transform 50 ohms into 2500 ohms and you can you can use that antenna and tune it on a number of bands the the downside of that is if that end of the antenna is down on the ground where people can reach it, you've, you've got a, a high voltage point that's a uh, like a shock hazard to anybody that touches it. But NFEDs have the advantage that um, once, you, once you successfully put that 49 to 1 ball in there and get the thing elevated high enough into the ground that you're not off the ground that you're not posing a safety problem, uh, you have something that you can tune up and have it work effectively on a lot of different bands. So it's a slightly more complicated because you need the ballon and you need to get you need isolators to get the RF off of the shield of the coax coming back into the shack. But you know, if if you're trying to put up like a simple, easy to make antenna you know, center fed half wave is probably the easiest. Okay, thank you. I hope that answers uh, his question. Well, it sure it did. Walter asks, what is good for eliminating tensioning on the ends of the dipoles at the tree when it's windy or snowing? Uh, okay, I've seen a couple of different ways of doing it. One one way is uh, if you're using if you if you're using pulleys the way I described them, the the uh, at the end of the rope where you the 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 uphaul rope if instead of tying that off you just hang like a weight like a 10 pound barbell um 
and do that at each end. Then when, when the trees move, when the limbs move and the antenna moves with the wind, those weights will move up and down to give with the wind. And, and that, that's a good solution. Another possibility is to uh, transition from the end of the uphaul rope to a, to a bungee so that the bungee um, can ex expand and contract and contract. Any kind of rope you use, by the way, even even the highest quality rope, you're going to be inspecting that rope every year and possibly replacing it and restringing it every couple of years. But like I said, weights or uh, bungee cords are good are good alternatives to uh, to keep the antenna at the right tension and and be able to have it give with the wind and not start snapping ropes every time a storm comes through. Yes, I I have the same issue, Neil and. Uh... And Walter, here, I have a number of wires up between the trees. And it's very windy. I'm at about 250 feet. And we get an awful lot of wind. And the trees aren't that thick, so they do sway a lot. I found, for me, I'm using springs from a storm door. And they're not very heavy, and they seem to give just enough. And I'm, as I look at them, they do have enough flex in them. I also leave a little bit more of a sag in the dipoles which also helps a little bit. Uh, is that uh, some value to that, Neil? I, I think so, yeah. I mean, I when I, I, I have my dipole, uh, you know, I had an Alpha Delta 8040 dipole up in a tree and I did pretty much what you said. I, I you know, I have them hard tied to, to the uh, end supports and I, I just, I give it a little bit of slack so that the antenna itself just gives with the wind. And it's a slight compromise in performance, if any, but just give it a little bit of slack so that it can give with the wind and, and you'll probably be all right. But the idea of a spring or a weight or a bungee cord, any of those three things will, uh, will be effective and, and solve that issue. For sure, for sure. Here's a question from uh, Brando. He says, I was thinking about putting up a Z let me see now, ZS6BKW variant of the G5RV antenna, but there seems to be so many modifications from various sources, adding capacitors, different ladder line, 300 versus 450 ohm, et cetera. Do you have any suggestions on the antenna or suggest someplace else to do more research? Uh, I'm not totally familiar with the variant that he's talking about but i know that everybody's got their own idea of how to how to tweak the g5 rv it was originally designed as a 20 meter antenna believe it or not and the 101 feet is a um one and a half wavelength on 20 meters which makes it just about the right impedance at the feed point 50 ohms and then you feed it with you know he used ladder line to feed it it was probably just what he had available and he went with a half wavelength of ladder line because impedance um if the if the if the feed line's not the same impedance as the feed point impedance like looking right into the antenna what you have at the antenna repeats itself every half wavelength looking down the ladder line so if you have a 50 ohm antenna and you have exactly a half wave of ladder line whether it's 300 ohm or 450 ohms, it'll be 50 ohms at the far end of the line if it's exactly half wavelength. And if it's not half wavelength, the ladder line kind of can be used to act as a matching section. That's why the 36 feet tweak that I like makes it so effective on 40 meters. So I guess my best answer is, you know, hey, it's wire. The wire's cheap. The ladder line is probably cheaper than coax. So if you if you see this ZX6, ZS6 variant, you can try it, see what it is. If you like it, great. If you don't like it, you know, try a different length, try a, another variant that somebody else has. Uh, and just try different things in, on your own and see, you might find something that nobody else thought of that, that works better than any of them. That's but everybody's got their own idea. Some people love, swear by G5 RV antennas. And some people just hate them. Um, I can tell you from experience, if you get one of these, one of those antennas up high enough and horizontal enough, they they play pretty well, particularly on 20 meters. So I'm 
hoping I answered the question. I don't really, I'm not familiar with that that particular variant, but I've done my own Google stuff around and I've seen a lot of different people with their own variants on, on non-resonant antennas of different lengths. Some people like 82 feet. Uh, 86 feet is a, is a popular length, or if you're making a vertical, a non-resonant vertical, 43 feet is popular. Um, the idea, if you're making it a non-resonant multi-band antenna, you want something that's not an open circuit on any band. It won't be at 50 ohms anywhere, but it won't be 2,500 ohms on any of the hand bands either. So that's kind of like the goal. So you have something that you can tune with a tuner no matter what band you're on. So that's kind of a rambly answer, but you know, bottom line, you know, if it's a wire antenna and it's all cheap stuff and expensive stuff, you know, play around, experiment, find your own, uh, find your own uh, answer. Okay. And, you know, use some of these other variants as a starting point. Excellent. Eric Soto, nice presentation. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. I, I have a G5 RV Mini, G5 RV Mini. And I was wondering, how can I use it inside my apartment? I'm in a building on the fifth floor. What would be the best way to avoid any high RF radiation inside? Well, to be blunt with you, if you're in a metal building, you're probably SOL. You're not gonna you're not gonna get outside of the you're gonna, you're in a Faraday cage. You're not gonna be able to really use it. Um, if you have neighbors above you. On the, if there's a sixth and a seventh and eighth floor, you got neighbors above you. It's probably you're probably not going to do too well with a G5 RV Mini in the in the apartment. Uh, unfortunately. Um, Shepard, he asked this question: Can I fold back the ends of wire instead of cutting them the wire? Yes. Yes, you can. You fold it back and, and wrap it around itself, and that allows you to shorten the antenna without actually physically cutting the wire. Okay. Max Strauss asks, why does my 132-foot NFED that is broadside to east and west get excellent results to South America, which is south of my QTH? Uh, I guess it depends on what band you're on. Um, if, if it's, if it's inverted V, if it's an inverted V configuration, it's probably more omnidirectional than if it's all perfectly horizontal. So that might be part of it that it's, that it's, um, more omnidirectional. And it may be that because an inverted V, each side of the inverted V is a sloper, basically. Um, it may actually radiate better off the ends than off off the broadside. Uh, if you're using it on that length, if you're using it on 80 meters, then theory says that's going to be um, it's going to have the most uh, you know the, the the best radiation pattern broadside, and it's going to have nulls off the ends, but if it's if it's an inverted V type configuration, if it's not a full half wavelength off the ground, all of that theory, uh, <clears throat> all of that theory goes uh, goes out the window. So you just happen to have you just happen to hit on a nice pattern, and got yourself a nice pipeline into South America. There you go. Sometimes that's the best answer. Peter Pilgrim asks, can you can can you comment on the DX hybrid antenna? No, I can't. <laughs> I'm not familiar with it. I'm sorry. Yeah, neither neither am I on on that particular antenna, really. Um, the only comment I have is a general comment. Um, if the antenna is physically much smaller than an eighth wavelength on the band you want to operate on, then it's probably a too good to be true scenario. Um, I don't know what this. I don't know what that antenna is. A DX hybrid. So I can't. I, I'm sorry. I can't comment on it. Yeah, he he corrected himself. He said it's a hybrid DX, but that doesn't help me. But yet there's a uh, Peter put up the uh, the website to hybrid DX, and perhaps there'll be some data there that might that might help. 
I can take a quick look. What's the what's the uh www.hybrid h y b r i d d x dot com. And folks, uh, we're running long. It's okay because we don't have any other presentations, and I see that we still have people in attendance. And uh, just a couple more questions, if that's okay with you, uh, Neil. Okay, yeah, this hybrid DX looks like it might be a good idea. He's doing, he's playing games with the antenna to make it uh, longer than it really is. You know, your horizontal footprint is only 79 feet. But if you look at the wire, there's more than 79 feet of wire. So it shows some promise. Uh, I don't know what they ask for it. Is that a horizontal antenna, Neil? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I don't know how much they want for it. I wouldn't spend a thousand dollars on one of these, but if you can get it, get this thing pre-made for hundred, you know, for and I'm I'm a little bit skeptical skeptical about how well it's going to work on 160. You're probably going to be it's probably going to be pretty pretty good on 80. And then 40 meters on down, it's it's physically bigger than a half wave, so it's probably going to work good on on 40 meters on down. Um, it's worth a try if if, if they're not asking a, an exorbitant price for it, and you can, you know, you're willing to take a chance with it. It'll it'll probably uh, it'll probably probably work for you. I don't see the price on the thing, but it doesn't matter. Okay. And I think I've seen stuff like this. I've seen uh, websites where they, you can actually make one of these. Interesting design. Hmm. Interesting. And I don't, th and, and the next question is, is that 70, 79 feet? Is that the length from end to end? Or is that the length, including these tails that go down that I'm looking at? Doesn't it kind of look like a double L a little bit? It actually looks more to me like a, just a variant of the inverted U configuration I had. Right. And it's got a couple of little zigzags right before you go straight down. And I don't know really what they do. But it definitely looks like something that shows promise. You could try it. Uh, I'm a little skeptical on how well this thing would work without a tuner. But and you've got 75 feet of ladder line. I don't know whether you go all the way to the tuner with ladder line. At some point, you've got to make a, um, a transition from the ladder line to, to coax. But, you know, you can go on to eham.net and take a look at some product reviews. Um, take the one, the ones and the fives with a grain of salt. The people that gives it twos, threes, and fours probably put a little more thought into their reviews. The ones might be, you know, whack jobs that don't didn't know what they were doing and blame the antenna because they couldn't get to first base with it. And the fives are people that maybe just you know whatever they bought this is this thing is great it's a, you know <laughs> but that's about it like i said i haven't i've never used one so i can't tell you but just judging from the amount of wire that's out there it's not small enough to be a too good to be true type thing so it'll probably it'll probably work effectively whether or not you can use it on all every band without a tuner, I'm very skeptical about that. You're probably going to need a tuner to to load it up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's good. Scott asks, can I run a wire antenna alongside a chimney on the side of a wood house without significant impact? Uh, I would say probably yes. On rainy days, if the wood is starting to absorb moisture, it may it may uh, it may detune the antenna or impact the uh, performance of the antenna. 
but generally speaking, uh, nowhere near as much impact as running it, obviously, uh, alongside of a metal house. But again, one of your things is like a brick chimney is going to absorb moisture, a wooden structure, depending on how well it's painted or something that may or may not absorb moisture and change its interaction with the wire in the rain. But you you can you can get away with it. It's worth worth a try. Like I said, I I, I lived in a house in Columbia, Maryland, where we had an attic. There was the the roof and the insulation. None of that was metal, and I was able to just run uh, a dipole inside the attic and zigzag it around so I could get 65 feet of dipole into like a 40 foot long attic, and I actually had a pretty good signal on 40 meters. So, yeah, your idea it is def this, there's a better than average chance that it'll work. That's it. Well, attendees, thank you for all the questions. Clearly, the, the quality of the questions and the volume of the questions indicates certainly the, the overwhelming interest in really such a phenomenal subject delivered by a phenomenal speaker. Neil, we can't thank you enough uh, for, uh, for taking the time and and answering these questions very thoroughly. Um, on behalf of HRU and myself, thank you, Neil, very, very much. So uh, that's about it, folks. Um, we're gonna be signing off now and uh, wish you a, a happy, healthy new year. And thanks again for attending HRU. This is a wrap for us. 73s, everybody. Okay, 73, Pete, thanks for- uh, Pleasure. Thanks for your as a co-pilot. Thanks for covering for me at noon uh, when I really needed that hour off to do other things. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Well, we'll, we'll have a lot of fun on an HRU review. Look forward to that. Okay, Neil. All right. You're all for the rest of the weekend. <laughs> Take care. Okay. Take it easy. Yeah, you too. Take care.